Well, welcome, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for coming out to our annual Castle Research Slam. My name is Marty Hershock. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts, Sciences, and Letters. And this is one of my very favorite events of the year. I love to see what my faculty colleagues are up to. And I think you will find this particularly entertaining. I'll keep my remarks short because we kind of um, went a little long. I think we already have to give out the Kiska Award early on here in terms of prep. So for those of you who are participating, uh, you do need to be mic'd so that we can pick up your presentations for uh, the recording. So uh, once you have presented, if you could find a Heather, who's over here, uh, she'll help you to take your mic off or you can hand it to her. And then um, uh, if you are next in line for presentation, um, make sure that you find Heather before you come up so that you're good to go and everything should run smoothly. So I wanted to uh, also extend a thank you to Sargon Partners for their sponsorship of today's uh, research showcases, both faculty and student. Um, I think you're in for a treat. The presentation style is um, a little different than what many of you may be familiar with. This is the second year that we've used this uh, style. It's one that I've used in my own classes. My students, when I initially assign it, look at me like they're going to th put a pitchfork through me. How, what do you mean 20 PowerPoint slides, 20 seconds each? All right, so that's, that's the style, that they've got 20 PowerPoint slides that'll appear for 20 seconds each. And we'll see how well they keep up with the timing. But it, it's really, I think it's, it's good. It really focus, forces you to focus, and you can actually pack a lot in uh, in that six minutes and 40 seconds. So, all right, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started here because I'm already two minutes late. Our first presenter is Professor Pam McCausland, um, who is a professor of psychology in our Department of Behavioral Sciences. And she's going to talk to you about modeling media's influence on rape myth acceptance and reactions to sexual assault. Pam. Thank you. So I'm Pam McCausland, and I'm going to be telling you about um, our media's influence on rape myth acceptance and uh, the reactions to a sexual assault victim. Um, media often subtly or not so subtly um, reinforces attitudes that accept and sometimes even actually encourage sexual violence. Um, and the media we use um, sometimes, depending on what we see, is uh, that we see that women who've been sexually assaulted are often mistreated or disbelieved. A conservative estimate is that one in every six American women has experienced attempted or completed rape. Although men are sometimes the victims of sexual assault, about 95% of victims are women. Negative consequences include increased rates of both physical and mental health issues, and this happens over the short term and the long term. We know that negative reactions that victims receive when they've been sexually assaulted has negative consequences on health. But less research has looked at the factors that lead to rape myth acceptance and that influence the reactions that the victims get. So the media practices model that we're using here basically says that these early life experiences, if I can do this, and individual characteristics influence the media factors. I'm going to talk about this more next. Um, let's just say it's not just about aggressive or sexual media consumption. That influences attitudes and then behavior. When someone identifies with media personalities, like the characters on Gossip Girl, they're often exposed to messages that promote both hypersexuality and hypermasculinity. Many young people look to the media and media personalities as a source of information about how they should look or act or dress. But identification always in, isn't always negative. This little girl is actually dressed up as her superhero RBG. So I, I have hope. <laughs> um, there's a large body of research that looks at consumption. We looked at consumption as both the amount of media people consume, but also we had people um, rate how much aggressive and sexual content they looked at in media. 
Um, and then there's a large body of research that looks at media's influence on aggressive um, or sexual or pro-social thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And we also measured, um, we had questionnaires that um, assessed that. So now back to the start of the model. Um, we expect that early experiences, including things like trauma or experiencing or witnessing interpersonal violence, might have an influence on then the media factors. We also think that these individual personality characteristics like dogmatism, which is defined as, um, let's see, make sure I get this right, the tendency to see one's own beliefs as undeniably true without consideration of the evidence or other people's opinions. And we think that's also related to um, media factors. And then we come back to this. We think those early, and, um, early experiences, life factors, influence media, which influences rape myth acceptance. Um, rape myth acceptance is defined as attitudes and generally false beliefs about rape that are widely and persistently held. And then those attitudes influence reactions to a sexual assault. So I'm going to tell you about our latest research. Um, I'm working on this with Chaz Lynn Miller and Michelle Leonard. We conducted a longitudinal study of emerging adults from across the US. Um, we um, created the surveys using Qualtrics, and we recruited participants through um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. And this was supported by funding from campus grants as well as our graduate program. Um, the time one survey included the measures of the trauma, dogmatism, rape myth acceptance, um, as well as media questionnaires and demographics. And then the second survey went out one month later. And this one asked participants to consider their reactions to three scenarios. But the one we're interested in was a scenario that um, was asking about a female friend who had disclosed that she'd been um, sexually assaulted by her boyfriend, forced her to have sex when she didn't want to. So our final sample is 507 emerging adults from across the US. About half are female, about two thirds Caucasian, majority employed, majority some college education. So now I hope I've given you enough that I can walk you through um, our results. This is our hypothesized structural model. Um, so we're basically feeding um, the stats program the way each of these variables is measured. And then we try and see if this hypothesized structural model fits with the actual data we have. Um, so we have um, trauma and dogmatism. We expect will predict media identification, predict more media consumption, rape myth acceptance, and then um, less positive, more negative reactions to victims. And when we look at the actual outcome, it, it did pretty well. Um, the only thing that didn't work was this trauma path didn't um, fit there, but all the other paths are statistically significant. The other interesting thing we can do with structural equation modeling is that we can look at the effects of early variables through the intervening variables on the outcomes. So in this case, um, dogmatism was really important. Greater dogmatism related to more media identification and then work through these other media variables and rape myth acceptance to relate to less positive and more negative reactions to victims. So um, we have to do a few things. We're going to finalize measures. Um, our measure of uh, media identification is really innovative, um, but we're not quite sure what we're, where we're going to focus it yet. And then the other thing we might do is move from kind of this traditional structural equation modeling into what's called exploratory structural equation modeling. You can see it's just really complicated, so we're not quite there yet. Um, the other thing that I haven't talked about yet is gender. And so you can see from this um, that I ran the model separately for males and females for just this one small portion of it. Media consumption and influence um, is related to rape myth acceptance much more strongly for men than it is for women. And so the next step is to really kind of parse this out and figure it out. But it's not just a simply a matter of looking at the two models separately. I have to do more complicated analysis. Um, so our implications for this, I think the one is to think about dogmatism and develop early interventions to really target um, fighting dogmatism and making people open for all ages. But the other idea would be to have our programs continue to fight rape myths and to make sure people intervene when they see something that um, they think is happening that's wrong and to be supportive of victims. Um, finally, media literacy is critically important now. I think we need to also do that really early. It's not just enough to say um, kids shouldn't be consuming aggressive or sexual media. I think it's really a matter of getting them to think about 
um, why and how they identify with particular media personalities, and then how the media that they do consume can impact them in large ways, their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Thank you. So did I win the award? No. Nah. <laughs> it's always hard to go first as well, so thank you, Pam. Well done. Our next presenter, and I'm sorry we don't have time for questions, but hopefully if you have questions, you'll seek Pam out later on if she's able to say she got to teach. That's why she was first. So you can email her. And uh, she, so our next presenter, uh, Professor Ilir Mateza from uh, the Department of Social Sciences. He's a professor of economics. And he's going to talk to you about to de-dollarize or not to de-dollarize a monetary policy dilemma. Ilir. Thank you. <laughs> Where's Mike? Mike Lachance. Oh, he's right there. Yeah. So Mike was trying to intimidate me yesterday. <laughs> he said he had given this presentation about 10 times to his wife, to his friends, to his students, and I didn't have a presentation at 4 p.m. <laughs> And so he said, time it. It's important. So I timed it. But the problem is I timed, I, timed it every, I timed every individual slide, but never the transitions. So if I'm not breathing in or out bit, with between slides and something happens to me, you know who to blame <laughs> or who to thank. Well, as Marty said, I'm Ilir Miteza, professor of economics and social sciences. Uh, I'm going to talk about a project that started with a paper with my uh, former colleague at the Central Bank of Albania. Uh, that's the Central Bank of Albania right there. It didn't look like that when I used to work there 20 years ago. So the, the main focus of the paper was to actually look at money demand. How much money does an economy need? So um, I'm hoping that the next slide will be, will be uh, upright. So, <laughs> so how much money does an economy need? So the, the, the paper revolves around this question and actually asks, does that amount of money change over time and what makes it change? So this is obviously important for central banks because, because they use money to actually influence the economy. They use money to keep employment and inflation uh, where they need to be. Um, in this paper, uh, we actually look at the stability of money demand, uh, and the main, our main concern is actually, and focus, is to actually tease out the role of exchange rates, tease out the role of foreign currency in this economy. So have you ever, and that's, by the way, that's the title of the paper right there, exchange rates, we just finished, uh, finished that, and uh, it has to be submitted soon. So the main questions uh, here are the following. So for instance, for you, have you ever thought about how you decide how much cash and how much uh, to keep in your checking and savings account? Uh, if, you're, if you're like me, you probably don't have a complex algorithms for deciding that, uh, that question, right? But we have good rules of thumb. Uh, that, are, that are, are dependent on a few things that we sort of intuitively, intuitively know and understand. Things like, for instance, how high is, is the interest rate? If the interest rate were to go up to 20 today, you'll probably be searching your couches for quarters and dimes <laughs> to go and deposit them in a, in a savings account. Uh, but also, how much money do we need to buy, right, for daily transactions, for, for sales and purchases, right? And that's approximated by our incomes by our paychecks, but for the entire economy approximated very well by the GDP, the gross domestic product. Um, and the main focus was this other question. In other words, does the exchange rate play a role? Now, of course, for a country like the United States, we never think about what the exchange rate is when we make decisions on how much money to hold, right? We just don't. Maybe we think about the exchange rate when we're preparing for a trip overseas. But actually, that's not the case in other countries, OK? In other countries, people actually think, OK, 
and calculate right, their money holdings, depending on what the exchange rate is, and they decide how much to keep in local currency and how much to keep in dollars or in euros. That's certainly the case in Albania, where people hold dollars and euros to hedge against risk. So this is where the new project is starting, okay? And what I have is sort of the plan for the new project at this point. Uh, and so that includes the dollarization of the economy, which actually the central bank has made uh, into a priority. The central bank of Albania has made into a priority for this coming year. Actually for this coming uh, five to 10 years, in fact. It's a long-term project. Um, so dollarization, what is it? Let's talk briefly, uh, briefly about that. Um, a dollarized economy is an economy that has excessive reliance on foreign currency. People hold a lot of foreign currency and people also use a lot of foreign currency for transactions, especially for big ticket items like real estate, cars, and so on. Um, so that's the, that's the focus. How serious is dollarization in a country like Albania? Or how big is it? Well, this gives you a sense. About 50% of all deposits are in either US dollars or in euros, okay? And the rest, of course, are in the domestic, in the local currency, LEC. Um, that there are good and bad things about that. Okay, so let's let's talk about uh, the the good thing: dollars and euros as a safe asset, as a way to di diversify savings. Okay, that is a good thing. So, um, however, this is not an issue here. We don't use euros here or an MB to actually diversify our savings. At least, not sort of. We don't think about it that way. We may, may buy you know, foreign stocks, but not necessarily just currency. This, however, becomes a problem for monetary policy. And why is that? Because the less local currency there is in an economy, the less traction they have. The less influence they have on, the, on employment, on inflation, on the things that they want to move up or down, as the case may be. That's the policy di dilemma. Do they de-dollarize or do they not? Right? Do they force people to actually hold less dollars and euros, or, or do they leave this alone? So talking briefly about each of those two sides of that policy um, seesaw. One, de-dollarizing. Okay? There are ways to actually force and make it more inconvenient, more expensive for people to hold foreign currency. They can do that. Um, uh, and the problem is that that could force more people into other assets, like real estate, for instance. Okay, that could that could cause a housing bubble. What's the other What's the other alternative? Is to actually leave this alone, and to live and to live with a less effective monetary policy, which could actually put the central bank's existence at risk. Okay, it would sort of make them render them ineffective and really redundant. Okay, so. Um, my plan is to look at experiences in other countries, Israel, you know, they're, they're, they're a long, there's a long list of uh, emerging, developing economies that have gone through this and to see basically whether they have suffered from asset bubbles or other unintended consequences of de-dollarization. Uh, what are some policy alternatives, depending on how this thing goes and what I find? Well, you could slow walk the de-dollarization, okay, because they've actually started it. So I, I don't think they'll, they're, they're going to do a U-turn and say we're not doing it after all. So slow walk it and buy yourself time for some good macro policies, low inflation so people can trust in the local currency, confidence can build, and, and there's less reason to actually hold foreign currencies, or an aggressive de-dollarization, which involves something that is almost just as hard to pull off, which is really to find other alternatives, uh, other safe assets. Thank you. How did I do? All right. So our next presenter is uh, Professor Deborah Smith Pollard, uh, Professor of English and uh, African and African American Studies. Uh, Professor Pollard's presentation is titled, Oh Happy Day, 50th Anniversary of a Game Changer. 
Hello. In 1968, the Northern California Youth Choir recorded a vanity album consisting of rearranged church hymns. The 500 copies they paid for uh, were to be sold to family and friends. An underground rock DJ heard the arrangement of Oh Happy Day and the rest became history around the world. Oh Happy Day was originally an 18th century hymn by Philip Doddridge. Edwin Hawkins's arrangement disrupted two mainstays of traditional gospel music. The song's rhythm was a mix of R&B and funk and jazz, and his keyboard accompaniment complemented rather than imitated the choir's vocals. These differences angered many traditionalists, but delighted countless others. Their song went on to number two on Billboard's R&B charts, number four on the pop charts, number two among UK singles, and number one in France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Its sales of seven million copies have never been repeated in gospel. The choir and later the pared down version that consisted of Hawkins' family won Grammy Awards and charted other new territories, performing on mainstream TV like American Bandstand and becoming among the first gospel artists to appear with a symphony orchestra, the Oakland Symphony in 1981. While current gospel artists such as Yolanda Adams are criticized for performing with secular artists, the Edwin Hawkins singers earned a Grammy in the early 70s for performing with Mel uh, Melanie. Their style of dress, as you saw, was also rather different for gospel. Some of the family members also became famous. The brother Walter um, became one of the top selling gospel artists um, and producers of the 70s and 80s. He was so successful that the brothers had to have a talk about how to not let fame and envy destroy their relationship. Uh, Walter's wife Tremaine also became a gospel mainstay. Tremaine became a gospel and crossover star as well. She recorded songs that became gospel classics, but also recorded music with artists like MC Hammer, music that was danced to in clubs that angered many of the same people who went after her brother-in-law because of Oh Happy Day's crossover appeal. Other artists were also inspired to reach a broader audience. Rance Allen, who's the one in the middle, was a teenager who decided because he saw Hawkins on American Bandstand, he wanted to spread the gospel in that same way. His 40-year career includes appearing on, wait for it, Snoop Dogg's top-selling double gospel album that was number one for six weeks this year. Um, and he is a gospel icon. We also look at Dorothy Norwood. She's there in the middle. This is back in the early 70s. Um, there were artists who said that when Oh Happy Day hit that we, quote, got paid, I mean really paid because of Edwin. Um, she traveled with the Rolling Stones for six months um, and they asked only one thing. They liked her music. They asked her to include Oh Happy Day. I said to her, um, did that affect your bottom line? She said, I said, I traveled with the Rolling Stones for six months. Uh -huh. um, next we have, if this will click on for me, Vicki McLateyad. Um, she is the founder of Gospel-Centric Records. She said it was Hawkins' music that compelled her to create her label because of how his music compelled her to love God more intensely. Um, known for its edgy hip-hop influence tracks, Gospel-Centric became the home of one of the biggest gospel artists ever, Kirk Franklin. He was up there a minute ago. Heaven knows what happened to him. But anyway, they also have performers on the label like the Gospel Gangsters. So that's how big that label became. There are other artists who talked about how when they were um, asked to go to Europe, they were told, you have to do Oh Happy Day, which is what they did when they went on their tours. Um, let me see. This is not doing what I wanted it to do. All right, so let's just go where this is taking me. This is um, evangelist Gwendolyn Reed, and I heard about her after I presented someplace else. She, she said God told her to go to Japan and start a gospel choir. She said, God, I don't speak Jap Japanese, and she said, the voice said, they speak English. She went, she started a gospel choir. People traveled, there were people who traveled to 
uh, and a half hours to come and be a part of her choir. For 20 years, whenever they knew that she was going to perform, they'd have to put on the poster that she would be singing Oh Happy Day. Here's Ricky Dillard. He's one of the artists who was told that if you go to Europe, you must sing this song. Um, here's Whoopi Goldberg up here. I don't know, it's like this thing has taken on its own life, but that's okay. I do radio. I can keep talking. All right. So Whoopi Goldberg, uh, there are many movies that have included Oh Happy Day, including Sister Act 2. Um, it is a slightly revised version, and in that scene, um, the choir starts out very laid back, and then once they take over, of course, they win the competition. Um, Secretariat is a mainstream movie, as was Sister Act 2, of course. But um, people wondered, how did the original version of the song get there? Well, first of all, don't tell anybody, but the director is a Christian. But he said he could not think of any other song that could capture that winning moment of the movie any better than that particular song did. And then just in the last year, Spike Lee's latest movie, uh, black Klansman, based on a crazy true story about a black man who infiltrated the Klan. Um, ten minutes into the movie, Oh Happy Day starts playing. I said, oh my goodness. Um, the song began uh, in a way that it became a marker for the time period in which this true story takes place. In fact, there are several other films in which the movie um, the, the song appears, including um, an X-rated movie, but we'll move on from there. Uh, there are more than 350 artists who have recorded the song. How do I know that? Um, because my first and wonderful research assistant, um, Ladesha, um, found it on um, Ladesha Moore. She also perked worked with one of my favorite librarians over there, and I thank you very much for that. Carla, finally, this is the one person who appears to have not benefited from the song, Oh Happy Day. That's Dorothy Morrison. She was the lead singer. Initially, she left because she was told she was going to be paid the same way that all the other artists were, and uh, her a husband and a lawyer said, but you're the lead singer, you should be paid more. So she left, she did some recordings. I think the only one that even broke, only one of them even broke past um, number 50 on the charts. Um, but she's still alive, still doing well, um, but just not as successful as the Hawkins family. All I can say to you is um, she has a line in the song that says the half has never been told. I've not even told you a quarter of what I can tell you about this song and its impact on the gospel industry, on gospel music, uh, around the world. Um, and the only thing I can tell you is there, there's this image over here that I'm sorry, oh, okay. So on my birthday, my wonderful LPA staff decided that they would create this cover, Oh Happy Day, to encourage me to hurry up and get this book done. So in the meantime, as I'm working on it, let me encourage you to uh, listen to the song at full volume and uh, send positive thoughts toward me so I can get this book done. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Professor Chris Bondiapade from the Department of Natural Sciences. Uh, Chris is a depart, uh, professor of chemistry. And he's going to talk to you about nanoparticle as catalyst, cancer remediation, and biosensor. Chris. So you're going to tell me like when to start. Ready? OK. All right. Good morning. It's great to be here. Uh, so I have, you will see uh, the slides are a little busy, but I will direct you towards you know, whatever we need to focus. So I put that uh, three project I was trying to do, it's a bit ambitious, uh, nanoparticle assembly, biosensor, and core shell nanoparticle. So we're going to see what are the things. So the unified uh, part here is nanoparticle. So we are going to say, see what is actually nano all about. Uh, so nano is a one billionth. It's a one billionth of a meter. It's a, a human hair. You can see 5,000 nanometer across. Smallest things we can visible is uh, 10,000 nanometer across. Uh, and the nano science is basically the study of anything in between one to 100 nanometer. And the application of nano uh, structures are called nanotechnology. So, uh, and then what happened, uh, once you go in that small regime, 
the material started behaving in different way. Sometimes it is actually, there are a number of opportunities in that uh, regime, and so you can have unique electrical, optical, magnetic, and other properties, and there are also less analyte you need, uh, more reaction side, so you can generate highly sensitive devices out of this. All right, so, uh, and then this is also a science which is actually an interdisciplinary. It has been you know, uh, brought from, from different uh, discipline, chemistry, ranging from chemistry, material science, engineering, physics, and so on. Now, when you see these nanoparticles generated, mostly it is in pre-synthesized in, in solution. But that is not going to see the potential impact. You have to organize this in a, in a fashion that you can use as a device. Like, for example, that QLED that you, you see ex expensive from Samsung, those are like you know, devices that are, that are organized. So we need to organize in a one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional fashion. Our focus is going to be two-dimension. And going forward, we are going to use those two-dimensional nanoparticle assemblies for catalysis, uh, nanocatalyst, then we are going to see generating things uh, on a spherical surface for cancer remediation and heat absorber, and then we are going to look at the biosensor. So this is, uh, like again, I said, busy slides. What we do here in, in terms of uh, uh, <coughs> so we take a surface, we functionalize with some positive charge, uh, layer with this molecule and hook up uh, an, uh, an ion and then change it that ion to that specific nanoparticle. So you can see here we have generated, this is atomic force microscopy, things you can see in nanoscale. There are special microscope. I don't have time actually to explain, but you will see some of the, <laughs> the microscope that we can see. It's a it's a different from optical microscope. And you generate these uh, gold nanoparticle, and you can see a surface becoming red in color. Here, it's a silver nanoparticle. And the catalyst is what we are going to use, this fuel cell. We call direct uh, alcohol fuel cell. These are generated to have alternate power source for handheld you know, small devices. So this we are going to use as a catalyst. And you can see, we know that any battery has anode and cathode, right? So anode, we have this oxidation. So methanol, I just give you an example. Methanol is oxidized to CO2. And cathode, it's the oxygen is reduced to hydrogen, uh, water. And this is the overall reaction. I just show you that one of the uh, earlier Toshiba has this kind of fuel cell. So our goal is to come up with this oxidation reaction. We have also generated uh, palladium nanoparticle, which can use for you know, use for oxidation of longer chain alcohol, not just methanol, because sometimes methanol is, is toxic. Here you can see there's a, you know, like a nice diagram. What it actually tells you that it's these peaks are oxidation. So they are all active catalysts. The only thing which you have to identify, the forward current versus back, the, the, the reverse current. These values are going to tell you how good this catalyst is. So you can see these lower panel uh, for ethylene glycol and glycerol, palladium is actually a very good catalyst. OK, now the interesting part. This is the core shell structure. Now why I put these things here, M&M and chocolate coated pretzel? Now the question is, when you eat M&M, it's a crunchy and chocolate inside, right? It gives you a different flavor. Like, for example, the, the, <laughs> the chocolate crow, is salty and chocolate. So we like it, right? It's a unique property. Same way, when you have something not conducting, with, coated with something conducting, it gives you a great material properties. That's exactly what happened. See, SiO2 coated with gold. It's a dielectric and gold. And it actually absorbs, depending on the shell thickness, in the IR range. What is the reason? If, it, if you have those kind of uh, material, it can actually absorb radiation from the IR range and gets heated up. And that can be used for destroying <coughs> cancer cells. So we, are, uh, we have made this, again, following the same procedure what we have, uh, I have shown you, that gold, you know, we absorb. This is not a flat surface. It's a sphere. And we generate, we put a uh, polymer, 
and then you know, uh, you know, absorb AUCl4, and then that uh, smooth sphere become a hairy ball. And then you, the hairy ball gets closed. You have a, the, the, the whole surface is covered. Same way we can have the palladium shell. So here is the thing. This is another microscope called transmission electron microscope. We have it here. See here, this smooth becomes a hairy ball, and then it becomes a closed shell. And this is the absorption that we are talking about in the IR range. This is also, as you use the 808 laser, you can see that there is a, you know, the, ch the change in the temperature from 25 room temperature, the nano shell goes get, get into 40 degree in no time, like 10 minutes, and that has been used for two minutes? No. Oh, <laughs> that has been used for the, the, the killing of the cancer cell. And I forgot to mention that we had an MQ project with uh, Professor Kalan Kandupali and uh, Ben Lee from engineering, and uh, they are, we are also involved in, in doing this for quite a while. This is the palladium uh, shell, palladium nanoparticle again. There's a palladium seed here. Seed means those hairy things, the little, little things. And then it, we can actually uh, change the thickness of this, like how much chocolate you want. We can, we can do that. <laughs> here is the thing, the last part is the bioelectronic. So when you have any analytes that you want to you know, analyze, you have to put it in on a surface. And then the surface or, or whatever the device, whatever the interaction happen, you get an electronic signal. Resistance change, maybe current change, those things, right? So here we are going to sense dopamine. And why dopamine is important? Definitely these are the, you know, one of the neurotransmitter. And these are, these are the reason why you have to have that dopamine. It's a small molecule. So we are, we are going to look at the change in current or potential. Here we generate same way, palladium nanoparticle, this is atomic force microscope. You see the size, mean size is around uh, seven uh, nanometer. And this is where we, we do current versus potential plot. This is a, like a jargon, you know, differential pulse photometry. This is one of the electrochemical techniques that we use. And what it happens, see, from 2.5 micromolar, means as the concentration is increasing, the do dopamine concentration is increasing in solution, the, the current is increasing. So that way we can sense, we can actually go really, really down low, uh, even nanomolar, not even micromolar. And also here, we can do it in presence of ascorbic acid, which is one of the component present in, in, the, in, in the human body, along with dopamine. So we need to see those interference. So, I want to also recognize this part, my student. These are some of my you know, earlier students. They have been, some of them have already graduated, like Amy, uh, Elisa. These are in the graduate school. Uh, this is one of the 2010 San Francisco ACS meeting. And now for the uh, recent one, uh, we have fall ACS meeting here, a group, and you know, the fall 2018 ACS meeting. And also I have some of my students here also, whose picture is not uh, here. So they are the one who actually made these things happen. You know, I go, you know, I scribble things, I hand wave, then things happen, right? <laughs> and, 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 and also, uh, Gabriela knows those because I keep sending the request for student travel. So she knows all of these students. And finally, finally, without this, nothing can be happened. So I really thank the the, the funding agencies for my supporting my research, and thank you all for your, you know, your attention. So notice how the full professors are fully winded. <laughs> That's all right. Interesting presentations. Thank you, Chris. So our next presenter is uh, Professor Lisa Martin. Uh, and Lisa has a joint appointment here in the College of Arts, Sciences, and Letters and in the College of Education, Health, and Human Services. Uh, her presentation is titled, The Sky Doesn't Fall, Combating Abortion Stigma in Medical Institutions. Lisa. 
morning. So for the last 11 years, I've been part of an interdisciplinary research team that has studied the impact of stigma on abortion providers' lives. Today, I'm just gonna share some of the findings from one of our most recent projects, a case study in conducting research on abortion in a large Midwestern academic medical setting, which will be identified soon. <laughs> abortion stigma is pervasive in the United States and impacts providers at multiple levels. From the individual level, this could be a provider questioning that her work is the right thing to do, while at the structural level, this could include state legislation that encodes negative stereotypes of abortion providers, implying abortion is more dangerous than other kinds of medical care. The idea that abortion is wrong or bad is so deeply ingrained in our society that anyone associated with it is stigmatized, from women seeking abortion, their partners, and the medical health care providers who help them. Messages commonly include abortion clinics as greedy, unsafe institutions that prey on women and equating abortion with murder. Providers are often depicted as illegitimate doctors who lack the technical and moral standing usually afforded to other physicians. Instead of respecting their expertise, public discourse calls them killers, questions their morality, and seeks to isolate them as somehow suspect and different from other types of doctors. One arena where providers report feeling particularly marginalized is by other colleagues within medicine. We heard from one prov provider, the ER staff will invariably say some crap about the jokers at the abortion clinic. There's this implied stereotype that doctors who do abortions are hacks who can't do any other part of medicine. So why do this study? Uh, we could find no data on physicians' attitudes about their abortion-providing colleagues, so we didn't know. Are other physicians similar to the general public or somehow different? We developed a short survey to assess attitudes towards abortion, abortion providers, various abortion laws that restrict access, and items assessing the experience of taking the survey in a work setting. Um, Another group had tried to include a few items about abortion on a larger product, and they were told by one of the deans of the medical school, we absolutely do not want this survey sent to the medical school faculty. There was too much fear about even broaching the subject, despite it being approved by the IRB, which was a clear example of abortion stigma at work. So instead of the typical route, we took a different path. We first emailed the chairs of the medical departments explaining that the hospital provides abortion, serving as the last final option for some women in our state and the region who have complicated medical histories. We then asked them to provide us with an anonymous email list of their physicians. We had no objections from any departments. We basically said, these are your colleagues and that you are likely to interact with abortion providers in the work that you do. We ended up recruiting from nine different departments in the hospital, including internal medicine, surgery, pediatrics, anesthesiology, family medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, psychiatry, pathology, and radiology. The study was reviewed by the IRB and deemed exempt. Every participant was entered into a drawing to win one of 10, of, one of 10 $100 gift cards. We had a survey open for two weeks, sent a follow-up email one week into it, and a final reminder about 48 hours before the survey closed. And during that time period, we heard and reached out from several department heads and people who had taken the survey congratulating us and thanking us for it. We had no complaints from HR, hospital admin, med school administrators, or participants. So 1,260 people were our potential pool, and we had 560 faculty physician responses, um, which was a response rate of about 34%, which is typical for doctors on online surveys. Uh, all departments that we had reached out to were represented in the final sample. Uh, we found that regarding abortion knowledge, 72% of participants were aware that abortion services were offered at Michigan Medicine. About a third had referred patients for abortion to freestanding clinics outside of the hospital system, and 19% had referred patients for abortion at Michigan Medicine itself. We found very favorable attitudes towards providers. Notably, 86 agreed that providers offer necessary care for women. 95% agreed that abortion providers are equally competent as other doctors. And 94% agreed that abortion providers are technically, equally technically skilled compared to other doctors. Uh, we also collected very interesting data around the role of non-abortion providing physicians in advocacy. 
78% said that doctors who don't provide abortion services can make important contributes to abortion advocacy, and only 35% felt that it was important for physicians to stay neutral in the US abortion care debate. About the survey experience itself, data on the appropriateness of this survey topic at Michigan Medicine was high with a 90% endorsement, 85% reported enjoying thinking about the questions in the survey, and 53% said, said that the survey questions made them consider things in a new way. We received several supportive comments throughout the course of the study, one being, thank you for doing this. While I do not participate in abortion care currently, I feel very strongly that abortion rights need to be protected and that physicians should play a strong advocacy role, just as we do for less politically divisive. We also, it became clear that some participants who do not support abortion felt censored within the institution. One person said, this institution is hostile to physicians who disagree morally on the topic of when life begins. Thank you for asking these questions. I am not comfortable discussing this topic within the institution. So even those who opposed abortion felt heard. Given the experiences of other researchers studying socially contested issues, we expected a fair amount of resistance to our study. And to the contrary, we were surprised that no departmental chairs voiced concern and several participants sent messages expressing support. We received no institutional backlash for following the distribution of the study, unlike our colleagues. Uh, you can successfully study contested topics in medicine. Our experience has implications for engaging physicians from all specialties in advocacy efforts to protect abortion access, engaging physicians in the management of medically complicated patients seeking care in hospital settings, and since the project began, several new projects, including a replication of this survey in Wisconsin, is underway. Thanks. Wow, see, um, just as the surveys can be done, so too can this presentation stop. So thank you, Lisa. Our next presenter is uh, Thomas uh, Bianchat from the Department of Natural Sciences. And uh, Thomas is uh, going to speak to you about, if coasts could speak, Geological Impacts and Paleo Reconstructions of Extreme Events. Thomas. Thank you. Sitting here, my heart has been beating ever since I found out that I need to use a microphone because my voice is a boomer and just speaking at this level is really challenging. The last thing I want is for people to make a V-line out the door covering their ears. <clears throat> Extreme events, namely hurricanes. I'm gonna go back to that one because extreme events, namely hurricanes, or typhoons, or cyclones, or the Australians call them willy willies. They are known for their majestic beauty. They are known for the poetry that they inspire. They're also known for their art, like this very famous painting from 1944 by John Marin. But hurricanes also cause a lot of stress, okay? Whether economic stress, whether social stress, imagine having your house flooded from Hurricane Katrina and moving to Houston and having your house flooded from Hurricane Harvey, so it causes PTSD, and also environmental stress. Now, what state has more environmental stress from hurricanes than Louisiana? It's a cultural icon, everyone loves Louisiana, Mardi Gras, filet gumbo, those LSU fighting tigers, LSU is in environmental peril. Every 100 minutes, a football field of wetland is eroded, and a large portion of this is from hurricanes. The wetland is important for a storm surge buffer, for navigation, for economic reasons. Scientists are saying that Louisiana doesn't look like the boot anymore. See, in Michigan, we have cultural importance. We're from the mitten. We live here. We're from here. In Louisiana, it's the boot. The problem is, it's not a boot anymore. The wetlands are very quickly being eroded, and it looks like the, the image on the right. Louisiana has America's first climate refugees from the Isle de Jean Charles. Five, 50 people are being evacuated. The federal government is spending millions of dollars to have these residents evacuated. So imagine if this is on scale of New York City, okay? It is a lot of effort due to these eroding conditions. Every year, we have a storm of the century, okay, Harvey, 
Irma, Maria, tens of thousands without power for weeks, months, no clean drinking water. Recently, Hurricane Michael. We cannot forget about Hurricane Willa that just impacted Mexico. If we don't do something, all of our coasts are going to look like this, unless, of course, you have the money and the ingenuity to build your house on 40-foot pilings that can withstand 250 mile per hour winds like this doctor did in Mexico Beach in Florida. This is after the impacts of Hurricane Michael. I did a lot of Hurricane Harvey research. Hurricane Harvey was very unique, okay? It intensified from a category one to a category four very quickly. It, it went over a warm water eddy and it stalled. It stalled over southeast Texas. It was trapped between a southeast and a northwest air mass, okay? And it rained so much, it stalled, it started to receive the water that had dropped and redeposited again. So this showed that re-evacuating to inland areas is not even good enough anymore to evacuate for risk assessment. How do we understand these risks and the climatological mechanisms responsible? What if the coast could speak to us? Hmm. We know that hurricanes cause significant geological change, okay? And this is where I come in. I am a geologist. I'm also a paleotempestologist, okay? So what's really interesting is from ship diaries, log books, okay? We can reconstruct these events going back to the 1851 for the U.S. Think about 1949 for Eastern North Pacific. For Western Mexico, they have little idea about hurricane pasts before 1949, okay? So paleotempestology, there is no better archive for hurricanes and sediments. They are beautiful reconstructions from all those layers. And with the aid of radiocarbon dating, you can see how many hurricanes happen on centennial to millennial timescales. Superstorm Sandy created these beautiful overwash lobes from storm surge over top in the barrier beach and pushing this material into a coastal lake or a coastal wetland. So this is the main proxy that scientists such as myself look for for assessing paleo storms. If we go in the field and take short perpendicular transects, we can see evidence of these storms on these multi-centennial to millennial timescales. Further out in the lake, you see stronger storms because a stronger storm will be needed to push sand into the middle of the lake. If you see the sand layer from a recent storm, that could be used to calibrate the intensity of old events. Now from this, we can get long-term records, which are beautiful. Western Lake, we see an active period, 1,000 to 3,400 years BP. And in present times, on these multi-centennial to millennial timescales, it's quiet. So the worst may yet be occurring. Fill work is a lot of fun. In the top left, we have a small group of fans, okay, that, that came to see what we were doing. This was in Honduras. Some sediment coring, we're using the XRF to see the chemical signals in these storm surge deposits. So it is a multidisciplinary, multifaceted research question. Now, I may be a little bit crazy, okay, but no one has tried this for the Great Lakes. Now, cyclones, when they reach their end, they become these extra tropical cold core systems, okay? They cause flooding. Flooding causes damages, okay? So it'd be interesting to take sediment cores to see if we could find long-term histories of these sediment cores, of, of these events. What is causing them? So through some site suitability determinations, there are a lot of areas that have been flooded. These are state or federal protected areas that are perfect to this research. So we've been focusing this research right now on the southern shore of um, Lake Erie. You see, I have a big smiling face in the right. I just came off of ankle surgery, so my load was pretty light on this research trip. Unlike Scott on the left, I sent him out to the nasty muck, waist deep muck to get sediment cores. He was not very happy with me for a little while, but <laughs> unraveling the mystery, so far the results are looking very promising. Beautiful shell lobe formations um, from these storms. Beautiful environmental change from clay to mud. If you can see on the right side, we have many sand layers. So to use radiocarbon dating, we can see the return periods um, of these events. Thank you. <laughs>
So our next presenter is Professor Don Shelton, who is the director of our criminal justice program here. And he's going to talk to you about the criminology theory of relativity, using genealogy databases to solve crimes. Should I leave your book up, Amy? I'll take it now. <laughs> <laughs> Just so I know my audience, how many of you uh, have submitted your spit to Ancestry.com or 23andMe? <laughs> oh, gotcha. All right. <laughs> um, I wanted to preface this by saying that this is a uh, project that I'm working on jointly with Dr. Fred Bieber. Uh, from Harvard University who is a biologist and geneticist. Uh, we are going to be giving a presentation at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and they gave us uh, normally their 20-minute presentations. They allocated an hour. You really think I'm going to do this in seven minutes? Okay. <laughs> I want to talk to you about the, the union of two major trends in our society. The first relates to genealogy. Uh, Genealogy has, uh, in the study of it and the interest in it, has simply exploded with the development of the internet because databases all over the world are available. Birth certificates, marriage certificates, obituaries. And so genealogists have been able to expand uh, their interests um, by finding access to data all over the world. That includes using their DNA. The second major trend is the use of DNA in my field. DNA is the most important development in criminal justice ever, ever. Uh, and the technology of DNA has uh, improved dramatically to identify and analyze portions of DNA. We've gone from needing blood samples uh, to using your saliva uh, to touch DNA maybe needing just a single cell in order to analyze DNA. Well, let me see if I can, I'll use this one. There we go. Uh, recently, these two fields have come together in an amazing way. We have been able to identify killers from examining the DNA of their relatives. Okay. Uh, the most famous example shown here is on the my right is the Golden State Killer, uh, who murdered several people in the 1980s, but went unidentified for decades until this came along. How did they solve that? Well, here's what happens. The police uh, get a DNA specimen from a crime scene. Uh, they analyze that DNA, uh, and then they compare it to the national database called CODIS, the Combined DNA Information System. But CODIS only has people in it who, at best or worst, have been arrested uh, for committing a felony. So there are a lot of people who are not in CODIS, hopefully most of you uh, who are not there. If when they submit that uh, analysis of the crime scene data, they get no match in CODIS, the specimen is simply not traceable. That's what happened with the Golden State Killer. They had DNA sample from the very beginning, but he was never in CODIS. Turned out the reason was that he was a police officer when they finally uh, solved, solved the case. So sometimes, uh, at the same time, genealogists are using DNA to find ancestors, those of you who spit for uh, Ancestry.com or uh, 23andMe or some lesser ones. From that, you generally get these sort of geographic, is this the line? Yeah. These sort of geographic results, and they'll tell you where your ancestors came from. Notably, most of them are European, because those are the people who submit uh, their spit uh, to Ancestry.com or 23 uh, and me. But this is the genealogical data that you get back. If you notice, though, when you get it back, you also get uh, the ability to download the raw data, the raw data uh, from, your, 
from your DNA, not just this geographic stuff, but a lot of other information that's contained in that raw data. Here's an example. Uh, this happens to be mine, uh, and a part of mine, uh, and it is the text version of the raw data. So here you can see all of the uh, paired bases here, the base pairs, and their exact location uh, uh, on, my, on my DNA. This is uh, half of one page. Uh, I stopped counting when the pages went over 239. Uh, so there's a ton of, of, raw, of raw data that's available. Enter a new company, GEDmatch. Okay. Uh, GEDmatch was started by two guys uh, in a garage uh, as a free database. And what they wanted to do was to give people more specific information about their relatives. They were interested in, for example, in uh, adoptees who were searching for biological parents or just generally genealogists who wanted some uh, specific information. So a number of people submitted their raw data that they got from Ancestry or wherever to GEDmatch and they put it in their, in their database. And here are some of the important differences. First of all, it can identify additional unknown cousins who did not test at the same company. When you go to Ancestry.com, you only get compared to the people who went to Ancestry.com. These are comparing anyone who submitted to uh, GEDmatch. You could find out the specific amount of DNA that is shared with others, and there are additional matches that were not identified by the, even in Ancestry.com because of the particular algorithms that they use. Here's the big difference. Ancestry and 23andMe, if they've participated in them, won't give you the names of your relatives. They'll give you a little click so you can send a message to within their message system to ask that person if they want to talk to you or identify themselves. GEDmatch lists the specific email of everybody who contributed. And so they identify those relatives by name, in, in effect, uh, by their email uh, address, uh, address to you. Well, excuse me. There are also some differences here. And uh, for those biologists I, in the audience, I apologize. Uh, Dr. Bieber isn't here to help me. Uh, but uh, basically, the CODIS profile that we have uses short tandem uh, repeats uh, found in up to 20 locations on the human genome. The uh, SNPs, this method of looking single nucleotide polymorphisms, is much more specific and looks for markers on uh, some 600,000 different locations uh, on, on your DNA. More importantly, when they do that, it can reveal a lot of particular information, not just about who your relatives are, but who you are. It, it contains physical characteristics, gender characteristics, all of those sorts of things. I was thinking I probably wasn't going to get any response to mine because somebody found the ugly gene uh, on mine, but uh, I'll tell you what happened uh, in, in just a minute. So here's how it works. The police uh, obtain this scene uh, evidence. They analyze it, either through their own laboratories or, in the original cases, submitting it to Ancestry.com. Uh, they analyze it and they get uh, the markers. They then get that raw data, send it off to GEDmatch. GEDmatch comes back with a whole bunch of potential matches up to third and fourth cousins, even by name. Then the police hire a, uh, an expert genealogist who uses that data and those people and public databases, remember those birth records, all of that sort of stuff, to construct a family tree of the person who submitted uh, of, the, of the specimen uh, DNA. And that reveals potential suspects in the case, maybe one, maybe 10, maybe 20. They use that and then they start eliminating, the police start eliminating people based on where they live, 
what their gender, things of that, of that nature. Uh, once they do that, then once they've identified somebody, this is an example from the Golden State Killer case, they look for discarded DNA. In the Golden State Killer case, they originally got it off uh, the, the handle on the passenger side of a vehicle. And then they went through his uh, garbage uh, and found DNA on a cup uh, that, that he uh, discarded. That's detailed genetic, uh, ge excuse me, genealogical work coupled with good old fashioned police work. Once they get uh, a match of those two, then they can get a warrant to go and get uh, a, a live sample uh, from, uh, from the suspect based on, based on that uh, match. So a major company has evolved just in the last few months called Parabon, uh, and that major company will do all of that uh, family tree forming and all of that genealogical research for the police to identify possible suspects. And they will even use that data. Remember all that data about personal characteristics? To develop an image. This happens to be an image that they developed compared with the suspect who was eventually, uh, who was, uh, eventually uh, identified. Parabon is currently working on over 120 cases uh, where they're doing this type of, uh, of research. Well, how likely is it that GEDmatch will come, will come back with a relative uh, that you can trace? Uh, a very recent study uh, showed that as the database of GEDmatch increases, uh, so will the likelihood. They predict that uh, when it's up to 3 million, and it's almost up to 2 million now, uh, that over 90% uh, would uh, return at least uh, one third cousin match. A third cousin means that uh, you share a great, great uh, grandparent. This is probably mine. Uh, but, uh, and a 40% chance that a second cousin, meaning you share a great, uh, a great grandparent. Uh, I thought that was interesting and how prophetic. Uh, I submitted all my stuff because I thought I'd be my own guinea pig uh, to Jed Match. This morning, this morning I picked up my lifeline, this phone, and this email came in regarding Jed Match dash, I am your relative. <laughs> Hi there, you were one of my matches. Looks like fourth generation matches in my kit number so and so. I'm looking for so and so. Do you have relatives with those names? Thanks, Ernesto Rupert, Sao Paulo, Brazil. <laughs> uh, I guess it works. Uh, fourth generation is a little further removed, and I never heard of Rupert, but at any rate. Uh, uh, but that likelihood is great. Let me move on uh, very quickly to uh, these concerns. We're examining, all right, I'll be quick. We're examining constitutional issues. Uh, that is, is it a violation of the Fourth Amendment to go about this process in that way. Uh, my conclusion is that it is not. Uh, among other things, when you go to GEDmatch, here's the disclaimer that you see. They tell you that this is going to be used for identification of relatives that have committed crimes. Uh, and so that's the doctrine of waiver. It is also the, the issue of the legal issue of standing that the suspect has no claim if the rights of his relatives uh, were violated because it's not a violation of his right. I'll move quickly though, however, to the question of ethical uh, considerations. Is that really a knowing waiver? Do people read that legalese or just flip, uh, flip through it? There's a lot of medical information in that data. What's the danger, uh, the security danger of that from hacking? Insurance companies would pay a lot for your medical uh, information. So there are some severe uh, privacy uh, concerns. On the other hand, when we talk about ethical issues, uh, what is our ethical obligation to help the police? Would you not want to share your genetic information to catch a killer or a rapist? Or more importantly, would you not want to share your genetic information to catch that person before they commit another murder or another rape. 
Those are significant uh, ethical issues that I think each person has to resolve uh, individually, but that uh, Dr. Bieber and I are looking at uh, in our study. So thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, I to go over. <laughs> yep. All right. I don't think an O'Lear needs to worry. <laughs> All right, our next presenter is uh, Professor Rose Wellman. Uh, Rose is a professor of anthropology, and she is going to be speaking to you about a more nuanced perspective, state supporters in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Rose. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Rose Wellman, and as Marty said, I'm an anthropologist in the Department of Behavioral Sciences. And my talk today is called A More Nuanced Perspective, State Supporters in the Islamic Republic of Iran. OK, so Iran is constantly in the news. Think back to the 2009 presidential election protests or the 2015 Iran nuclear deal and its current dissolution under Trump. Um, indeed, our attention on Iran as an enemy and an other has been ongoing since about the time of the 1979 Iran hostage crisis. Um, and it's something that continues today. So we're experiencing this demonization. Um, a central image of this tension is the Basij. And uh, the Basij is Iran's voluntary paramilitary organization. It was founded by the 1979 um, leader of the revolution, the Ayatollah Khomeini. <laughs> and it's often translated as the people's militia. So members of the Basij were the original revolutionaries who upheld the holy war and the sacred defense of Iran. And um, they were among the first to go to the front and be martyred. And um, unfortunately though, a lot of the Basij are actually inactive. They just, they have ties to officialdom, but they're not directly still working for the state. So they're just connected to officialdom. Um, but nevertheless, few categories of person um, are, are tracked as much disapproval or kind of negative publicity than the Basij today. And um, we don't actually know much about these Iranian state supporters. But what we do know, unfortunately, is uh, from journalistic accounts that are often distorted by Orientalism. And that's a way of seeing a difference between East and West that paints Muslims and Arabs and Iranians and others in the Middle East as exotic backwards, uncivilized, and even dangerous. At the same time, much of the recent anthropological literature on Iran uh, focuses not on state supporters, but on the people we are most likely to admire, uh, the urban middle class youth who resist the confines of the state, especially in urban centers of Tehran and things like that. So those are the people we know about. We don't know anything about the everyday people who don't support the state, or who actually do support the state. Um, so my research is an attempt to move beyond the sensationalist headlines on Iran by exploring everyday life among non-elite state-supporting families. Between 2007 and 2010, I conducted more than 15 months of research with members of the Basij, first in Tehran and then in Farsabad. I interviewed people, I lived with them in their homes and conducted participant observation. I attended rituals and public events. And the point was to understand what makes their life meaningful on the ground. Um, what were their aspirations and their values? And uh, what I found was that people I met were striving to change what they called what is into what should be for their families and for their communities. They wanted to achieve a harmonious and virtuous Muslim society linked to God. They were witnessing a lot of problems in their current society, and that included drug addiction, it included superficial piety, divorce, and they wanted to do something about it. Um, and so to do this, they said they needed to continually defend the Islamic Republic from spiritual and moral corruption, as from the materialistic West, while ensuring the spiritual and bodily health of their kin and reckoning on the Day of Judgment. They did this by cultivating the purity and morality of their families in their daily lives, by eating together around the dining cloth or sofre, by cooking and feeding each other delicious Iranian food, and by praying. Nusheen, um, depicted in the next slide, is at a tomb of a descendant of a Shia imam. And she prayed every day for the spiritual well-being and health of her family in the face of the rampant family problems that she and her family were facing, including the loss of a nephew to heroin overdose. 
So these people are experiencing a world in which there's a lot of suffering, and they're trying to find a way to solve that. And they're doing it through praying for their families, by cooking food, by just living their normal lives. These aren't the brutal, bearded morality police you might have seen in the news. Um, and they also sought to honor their dead. So here, the family I lived with visits their recently deceased patriarch on the Iranian New Year, offering the items of spring at his grave. However, their familial mourning was not limited to their own families. They also participated in national rituals that similarly emphasized the values of moral and pure kinship. In this photo, you can see the mothers of martyrs at a commemoration for two unknown martyrs who were unburied from the Iran-Iraq war border and brought to this town to be reburied and memorialized and to create a sacred space in the center of the town. And um, they, uh, following the event, the Friday Imam addressed the crowd and said, because this martyr is unknown, he said, we the people are his brother, his sister, his mother. So this idea of kinship is really significant for them and it's something that shapes their lives. So often they sought to achieve a pure and moral and virtuous society by cooking vast amounts of food at home, a vital part of their daily experience of kinship and distributing it to their neighbors and fellow townspeople. So this was an attempt to bless and shape their community through the actual pouring of food from the home out into the community. So this is tons and tons of rice. Think thousands of tons of rice in everywhere across Iran during the religious holidays. And uh, the results of these findings are my book in progress, which is tentatively titled Feeding Iran, Shia Families and the Making of the Islamic Republic. And the book draws from the case of Iran to explore how ideas and practices of kinship and religion can be mobilized in the sphere of the nation to shape and legitimize the nation state. And we see that happening every day because kinship kind of is a source of naturalization and legitimization. Um, so thank you very much for this. Try to be fast. Our next presenter is a repeat performer. I think he's actually maybe done all of our research slams. <laughs> so um, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Caleb Seifert, who is a professor of psychology. And I'm reading slow so he can get mic'd. Uh, Caleb's uh, topic is Stay Away It Hurts, How Attachment Ambivalence Contributes to Stress-Related Physical Symptoms in Young Adults. I've long thought that uh, it, when you become a professor, you should just automatically get a master's in audiovisual. It should just be given to you. So I'm Caleb Seifert. I'm a professor in behavioral science. The title of my talk is Stay Away It Hurts, How Attachment Ambivalence Contributes to Physical Symptoms in Young Adults. So if you want to avoid illness, health psychology has some things that you could learn from it. First, exercise. Second, sleep. Third, eat healthy. But surprisingly, there's some other things that you can do that aren't so intuitive. One of them is have good friendships. Have some close relationships with people that you care about. Health psychology, is one of its most consistent findings is there's a social immune system and people who have better relationships get sick less frequently. When they do get sick, they have less intense symptoms and they also recover from being sick faster. And don't take my word for it. Take Dr. Sheldon Cohen, a Carnegie Mellon fellow who researches stress and immune function. He does fun studies like brings you into the hospital, exposes you to the flu virus and then he sees which of you gets sick. Here's his data. People lower in sociality get sick much more. But why? Why is that? Well, there are many possible explanations. One is we know that stress is linked to immune function. For example, people who are most, more stressed, natural killer cells don't work as well for them. They have fewer red blood cells. All of this increases vulnerability because red blood cells battle evil virus cells. In addition, Stress causes, causes us to release cortisol, which also lowers immune function and makes inflammation worse, which makes you have worse symptoms if you do get sick. So we know that social support reduces risk, but what are the specific mechanisms through which that occurs? One possibility is that people who have access to social support are literally doing things that people who don't do not. Rose's presentation is a good example of that. Another way is humans are complicated. We think 
about relationships and how we think about relationships can affect us. You want to be stressed? Just imagine your partner cheating on you. That will cause you stress. <laughs> it also could be both. People who have more positive expectations of relationship interact more positively with others, while those who have more negative tend to isolate more and are stressed more. In addition, some people thinking about their relationship is actually a source of stress. <laughs> so thinking about it brings stress on. We've linked this to attachment style. Most people, about 70% of the United States, have a secure attachment style, meaning they're balanced. But some people are very avoidant. They don't like relationships. They keep others distant. They're too cold. Some are very warm. They're very clean. The thought of losing a relationship is terrifying to them. This study is going to focus mostly on insecure styles. But there's also a third insecure style that we've studied here at University of Michigan Dearborn. They turn out to be a group of people who are both. They are simultaneously afraid of getting close and they really desire relationships. As you might expect, these people are, tend to be at risk for the worst outcomes and they have historically been poorly measured. <clears throat> I've done a lot of research in my life, but I would say I'm only proud of a little bit of it and I'm very proud of this. <laughs> so working with the students, We've developed a measure that looks at this specific type of attachment insecurity, and that's known as uh, attachment ambivalence. And if you're interested in that, you can find more information on the website. So the present series of studies is, is designed to look at how relationships might impact stress. The first study will look at attachment, capacity for healthy dependency, and does attachment influence that, and what are their unique and shared pathways to stress? The first study is done in 483 college students. So first, did attachment relate to stress-related physical symptoms, so things like headaches? Absolutely it did. All three were related. Attachment ambivalence was the most related. Don't worry so much about these numbers. Instead, look at the circle. Unfortunately, counter to my expectations, good I guess too, attachment ambivalence was the most significant unique predictor. So why? Why was this happening? Well, it turns out the primary reason is just being concerned in this way increases your stress level. But also what we saw was people who were concerned in this way engaged in much less healthy dependence. They turned much less to others for support. And that too was a path. In study two, we did the exact same type of thing, but we used a community sample. This time we didn't study healthy dependency. What we studied was intimate behavior. How often do you turn to your primary partner for support? We found a similar pattern of results from the first study, but everything was higher. Folks out in the community, the more insecure attachment that they had, the more stress-related physical symptoms and pain they experienced. This time, I got pretty much exactly what I predicted, yay, which was attachment anxiety and ambivalence were each had unique pathways. For this presentation, I'm just going to focus on ambivalence. I had predicted the attachment ambivalence would lead directly to stress. So the more you worried about your relationships, the harder relationships were for you, the more stressed you'd be. But I also thought it would cause fear of intimacy, and indeed it does. However, this doesn't seem to be an explanation for why these individuals have more pain. Finally, in a third sample, what we did is we looked at attachment again, and this time we looked at interpersonal behaviors more generally, not just in your intimate relationships, but interpersonal behaviors more generally as unique pathways to stress-related symptoms and pain. <clears throat> what we found was a lot of relationships. I'm just showing you a few. The attachment findings are pretty much identical to the prior study. Yay, replication is good, especially in psychology. <laughs> we had a problem with that recently. Um, and again, the unique paths are the same. What's a little bit more interesting here is, again, we find the same primary relationship. One directly being ambivalent makes you stressed, but also ambivalent people when they are in relationships have trouble setting boundaries and this increases their stress and pain. In addition, they're more likely to isolate themselves from other people, lowering their access to social support and that contributes for pain. About 33% of the reason these individuals have problems with pain is that the way they're engaging with other people is problematic. A part of how this is helpful is there are some implications. One, you can use attachment ambivalence as a screener for who's likely to have high stress. 
Two, changing the way people think about other people, increasing their ability to have healthy boundaries, decreasing isolation, and increasing the capacity for healthy dependency all reduce stress. These are things clinicians target. If you want to know more, several students are presenting on this topic today at the student presentation, and also many of their posters are online. Thank you very much for your time. That's okay. Um, so Margaret is next. Did you get mic'd yet, Margaret? Did you get mic'd. I will okay. find your presentation. She'll, she'll mic you up over there. So while Caleb is earning his extra pay, <laughs> um, I will introduce our next speaker. Will be is Margaret Murray, who is professor of communication, uh, and she's going to be talking about race, class, and authenticity in Pitchfork Music Reviews. The reception of Vampire Weekend and Lil Wayne. Okay, just click on that. Great, thank you. Okay, so in this project, I'm interested in how some musicians get categorized as serious artists and granted artistic license. And I became interested in this because the internet has made so much music available, it feels infinite. Um, it can be overwhelming, and I argue that this has actually made music critics more important as agenda setters. So they may not be able to convince us what we like or what is good, but they can convince us what is important and worth talking about and paying attention to. So I decided to study one of the most popular music review sites, Pitchfork. By 2013, they were receiving 2 million visitors a month. In 2015, they were purchased by Condé Nast, the mass media international conglomerate, um, and they build themselves as the most trusted voice in music. It all started in 1995 by a man named Ryan Schreiber. He was 19 years old, record store clerk living in his parents' basement. Uh, he is still the editor-in-chief. He has always been the head of Pitchfork. And he sort of brought an indie authenticity standard to Pitchfork. So when you go through, when I went through their reviews, I could see this standard being applied in the reviews. Um, unstated criteria, but very prevalent, just the same. From British cultural studies, we know that indie authenticity is concerned with the appearance of not being motivated by money, rejection of popular music, uh, celebration of obscurity and failure, and demonstrating this through a canon of underground rock references. Um, and this is displayed by indie musicians through their hair, their clothes, their lyrics, the instruments they use, uh, this rejection of the popular. I decided to focus on two artists that Pitchfork chronicles obsessively who do not seem to initially fit this mold. The first is Vampire Weekend. They're from Brooklyn. They're on an independent label named XL, so they seem to fit the criteria at first, but they, um, are very well dressed and their lyrics celebrate their social class. They met at an Ivy League school, they sing about Cape Cod, Egyptian cotton, Oxford commas. Um, and you would think this would be a problem for Pitchfork, but they say it's okay because they are actually rich. Um, so they're not pretenders, they're not faking, they really are polite East Coasters. Um, and here's a quote from one of their reviews. Another reason that Vampire Weekend seems to not fit the indie mold is that they use Afro-punk music. So they bring in African beats into their indie songs. And they've been accused by other critics of cultural appropriation, including the New York Times. So I wanted to see how Pitchfork dealt with this. Um, they basically argued that Pit Vampire Weekend grew up listening to other white musicians do this, such as Paul Simon. So therefore, them doing Afro pop was authentic. And because this is indie, they also brought in um, more obscure references like Orange Juice or The Talking Heads. Um, so Vampire Weekend got good reviews on their first two albums, but their highest reviewed work was their most recent album. Um, this got the best new music distinction, later went on to win a Grammy. Um, and this album was different because they moved away from what made them famous and they did straight ahead indie rock, emotionally direct lyrics, no Afro pop, um, and Pitchfork lavished the praise. This was even more 
um, create creative and um, a leap forward in emotional directness. So Vampire Weekend kind of couldn't lose. They could move across genres. They could take from different um, genres, and it was a Pitchfork loved it. I wanted to contrast this with another artist who they chronicle obsessively, um, who doesn't seem to fit the indie standards, and that's Lil Wayne. Lil Wayne is fully enmeshed in the corporate music industry. He was signed at the age of n age nine. He is the head of a subsidiary that of uh, Universal Records. He's won five Grammys, um, and his 2008 album was the most popular album of that year, top selling. Um, they have reviewed 19 of his albums, including internet-only releases. Um, some of them, they gave very high reviews, some of them very low reviews. So I wanted to rhetorically analyze what was going on in these reviews. One of the things that they emphasize whenever they talk about Lil Wayne is that he is very unique. Um, they talk about how weird he is, how he's eccentric, and how some of his choices are very off the wall. And they emphasize that he does things um, because of who he is, and that he's more important to be an artist than to be popular. And that, so they like him basically in spite of his popularity, not because of it. But they limit his creative talents almost exclusively to rapping. So whenever he tries to um, venture outside of rapping, the reviews are much harsher and tend to be lower, more negative. Um, so this quote, you know, he's very good at a few things, but he's not good at playing guitar, singing, selecting rappers. Uh, when he released a crossover album called Rebirth, this was his rock new metal album, they gave a scathing review. Um, the pullout quote actually said he was unqualified to make this rock album, which if you know the history of pop, pop, punk and rock music, no one is unqualified. <laughs> <laughs> but for Pitchfork, Lil Wayne was. Um, they went on to say that if he wanted to move genres, that he should have followed in the steps of Andre 3000, who drew on Prince, and not draw on Evervescence. So basically stay in the black canon of music and not go into the white canon. So um, with limited time, why does this matter? Uh, I argue that who gets categorized as artist is very crucial for who gets to have a long career, who gets to cross genres, stay in the public realm, be creative. Um, we also can see how cultural appropriation is rhetorically legit legitimized in the case of Vampire Weekend. Um, and basically, who gets to be the weirdo who has a long career and who's <laughs> dismissed? All right, thank you. Our last performer. Uh, last presentation is Professor Mike Lachance from uh, Department of Mathematics and Statistics. He's also Associate Dean in the College of Arts, Sciences, and Letters, and he's going to talk about uncrushing the can. Okay. So this is your favorite class. <laughs> so um, this is a metaphorical introduction. I'm actually not going to crush a can, not on my head or anything like that. The metaphor that I want you to think about is when you have a can and you crush it, the top goes down on the bottom and the sides sort of crumple up, so it's the distribution of the crushing that we're interested in. This product, Z star AZ, is the product that keeps me up at night, early in the morning, if some of you know my emails. Uh, you can think of it as just multiplication. The A is an actually like a table of numbers, a square table. The Z is like a column of numbers. They're complex numbers, but that doesn't bother us. This is as formal as I'm going to get, so the mathematicians in the room can see what the definition of the numerical range is. All you have to do is think about A, this matrix is like a boot. And the uh, can is something the boot's going to crush, and the flat image is what we're going to pay attention to. So there are two things associated with a boot its size and its tread pattern. So in the top three matrices, you can see there are different sizes, two, uh, two, three, and four, full treads. The other ones are sort of sparse treads, and those are the ones we get to focus on. When I talk about the can, I sort of misled you. It's not a cylindrical can, it's actually a spherical can. And the dimension of the spheres will actually rise with the size of the matrix. And so in order to 
sort of capture what higher dimensional spheres look like. Timing, there it is. So you can imagine equally spaced points on a line and wrapping that around a circle. And you can imagine equally spaced points on a plane and wrapping that around a 3D sphere. And you can imagine equally spaced points in three dimensions wrapped around a four dimensional sphere. So this is the kind of imagery that we're going to be working with. When you think about what happens in terms of crushed cans, the little upper triangular two by two boot uh, has an elliptical cross section. When you look at this one to the right, you see this sort of trilobed affair. And if you look at the four by four one in the bottom, you can see is actually the little upper triangular repeated twice, and you see two ellipses. Well, what we want to do is focus on two examples today. We're going to look at a two by two boot. Effectively, it's a 3D sphere that's going to get crushed. And the profile of the crushing is an ellipse. And we want to understand what actually goes on. So the, uh, when you, what we, in order to sort of figure this out, what we did is we took the images of circles on the sphere. Because they get squashed into a flat plane, we saw that the circles sort of overlapped. And it led to this sort of idea. Well, the idea that we saw is that each point in that shaded region is intersected by exactly two circles. Now, when I say we, who am I talking about? I have three colleagues who join me every Tuesday at 11 o'clock. We pioneered, I think, what we now call protected time. So we do not talk about restructuring of the college. We do not talk about our children. We do not talk about the weather. We talk about the numerical range. So what we did in this particular problem is we discovered that the, that little small loop on that sphere that little loop gets projected onto the ellipse. That's the smallest little region. What surprised us is that the outside also gets projected onto that ellipse. We didn't expect that. In effect, it's a two to one map. So who cares about this? Well, the Math Monthly is one of the, it's, it's a widely read mathematics journal. You don't use that phrase with math journals, widely read. Okay, so we're very pleased to have it there. You can see my collaborators there. Clifford Jabush and Vizwathana. Our second problem, the one we're working on now, is what happens if you have a boot that has a diagonal tread pattern? Well, the crushing this time isn't into an ellipse, but actually into a line segment. And so what happens is uh, we want to figure out what happens if we have a two by two, a three by three, and so on. So back to the two sphere. If we take equally spaced points and we crush them with this particular boot, we see that the points are not uniformly distributed. And so we make a little histogram and then we simulate this and we say, how about if we have 2,000 points on the circle and we see this distinct pattern. And so we want to predict what that pattern is. Well, that's the goal. That's the gold standard of being able to say what that profile is. This is a well-known distribution. It's called the arc sine distribution. So we are just sort of, um, establishing sort of groundwork. The next thing we want to do is turn our attention, though, to the 3x3 three three case. And so in the 3x3 three three case, we now have uniformly spaced points on a sphere. They, too, when crushed, do not distribute themselves uniformly. The histogram oh, it doesn't tell very much with 90 points, but you start to see a distinct shape when you have more. And so the challenge for us is to say, what exactly is that profile? And we have been able to do this. So we can say what the little red curves are there for the PDF and the CDF. And that particular distribution is of interest, not necessarily to us, but it turns out John von Neumann in the early 1940s was trying to figure out what that distribution was and was unsuccessful. And it's still unresolved, so we at least have uh, made a small mark on the problem. So now, flush with success, we want to look at the 4 by 4 case. <laughs> So once again, we see this sort of histogram. And as we increase the number of points in our simulation, we start to see, OK, this is the shape that we are trying to uh, uh, understand. And so um, this is, of course, a particular example. There's, uh, this is the same von Neumann type distribution that we're interested in. We do not know what the solution is to this yet. Uh, for the 3x3 three three case, we have two different approaches that yield the same result. Uh, we're trying those two different approaches here in this case. So that's sort of our work in progress. As I put together this last slide, I thought this whole thing that I do is sort of self-indulgent. 
I mean, it's like going down a rabbit hole not to mix metaphors. Why would anybody do this? I'm gratified that it has some application to other people. But for my part, it really sort of feeds something inside. And that's why I do it. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, and thank you to all of our presenters. Would you please join me in thanking all of them for their wonderful presentations? And we need to break quickly here because we're going to move into the student section. But uh, of course, no research slam would be complete without the awarding of the coveted, or not so coveted, uh, Kiska Award. Um, this year's recipient, I think you can guess who that might be. So, um, Don, show. <laughs> Given Don's longevity today, we may actually uh, start a new pattern of renaming it on an annual basis for last year's recipient. So next year, it will be lovingly known as the, the Shelton Award. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. And um, so, Sue, are we still having, we're moving next door. So thank you all. Appreciate it.